Good afternoon. I'm Janae Owens, an Education and Training Specialist with the Institute of Child Nutrition, and I would like to welcome you to the September School Nutrition Star Webinar on Strategies for Achieving Quality Customer Service Among School Nutrition Staff. During today's webinar, all attendees are muted. There will be time for questions following the last two speakers' presentations. If you have a question, please type it into the question box on your screen. We will try to get to as many questions as possible, but due to our time constraints, every question may not get answered during the webinar. Individuals who have registered will receive an email 24 hours at the, con at the conclusion of the webinar. The email contains the webinar recording link and a link to the evaluation survey. Please follow the link to complete this survey. ICN will send out the certificates within 48 hours. To assist in meeting the unique training, technical assistance, and professional development needs of school nutrition professionals, ICN has launched the School Nutrition STAR Strategies, Training, Action Plans, and Resources Initiative to assist school nutrition professionals in developing goals and best practices to improve program administration and operations. The School Nutrition STAR program offers a multitude of elements including face-to-face -face workshops, virtual instructor-led trainings, webinars, and spotlight success stories. The Institute of Child Nutrition collaborated with USDA to host monthly STAR webinars. The STAR webinars offer training, real-life strategies of program implementation, and best practices to incorporate into action plans and or goals. Training topics, free resources, and educational materials are also highlighted to assist school nutrition professionals with navigating through the enhanced responsibilities of school nutrition operations. The Institute has created a website for all materials and resources specifically related to the webinar. You can find the information at the, the icn.org forward slash star. Thank you for joining today's webinar on strategies for achieving quality customer service. The topic covered in today's webinar fall under the key area administration and meet the USDA Professional Standards Code 3400 Human Resources and Staff Training. Today's webinar panelists are including myself, Janae Owens, Education Training Specialist with the Institute of Child Nutrition, Laura Gilbert, Laura Gilbert excuse me, MS, RD, SNS, FADA is the Senior Director of Food and Nutrition Services at Orange County Public Schools, where she has worked for 17 years. Laura has received many honors for various accomplishments over the past 21 years. The Orange County Public Schools has eighth, is the eighth largest district in the nation, and it employs 1,624 school nutrition professionals. Our other panelist is Spencer E. Taylor, MS, RDN, LDN, is an Executive Director of Nutrition Services at the Metropolitan Nashville Public Schools in Nashville, Tennessee, where he has worked for the last seven years. His experience in school nutrition has spanned over 20 years. He has previously worked experience as a clinical registered dietitian, restaurant manager, college food service manager, um, college food service manager, currently Siri serves as the U.S. Army Reserve at the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. On the screen, you will see the learning objective for today's webinar. We will also talk about strategies to achieve quality customer service among our external customers, which are primarily our students. Today we are going to focus on strategies for achieving quality customer service. Customer service should be the foundation for everything you do to provide a customer-friendly school nutrition program. Ultimately, customer service starts with you. Customer service is more than a friendly smile and a greeting. It involves everything about the products you sell in your school nutrition program. Customer service is the combination of the product, price, presentation, support, information, and delivery. Everyone who influences the customer's eating practices in your school nutrition program should have some responsibility in providing a customer service. 
It is not common to think of the school nutrition staff as customers. The basis of your personal needs and expectations with customer service are just as important as your customers' needs and expectations. Every day, you, as school nutrition staff, should set a standard for making sure each customer is served a healthy, appealing meal in a clean and welcoming dining area. What you do every day has a major impact on the school nutrition program, so you are a vital component of the customer service experience. And of course, the external customers are the people you serve or have the potential to serve every day. This includes students, teachers, administration, parents, and etc. Communication has a powerful effect on the school nutrition program. As school nutrition staff, you work with a diverse group of people and you all play a different role as, you, as, as well as doing your job. Each role requires a special set of skills, but most importantly, every role requires um, interpersonal skill. Interpersonal or getting to along with other people is working as a team on the serving line, in the kitchen, and with students. Good communication can make the school nutrition program a pleasant place to work. Effective communication makes the teachers and administrative staff want to work with and support the school nutrition program. As a school nutrition staff, you need information in almost all tasks, so information skills are just as important. Informational skill requires using and sharing information. For example, do you use standardized recipes for preparing food, placing signs on the serving line to let students know what a reimbursable meal is, and the choices of menu items? The way most people communicate um, can be categorized, categorized as verbally or non-verbally. Simply put, the words you say, how your voice sounds, and your hand, facial, and other body gestures are all ways you communicate. It has a major impact on your job effectiveness and your relationship with others. When you think about your school nutrition team, you know that you are the key players in achieving the nutritional, educational, and financial goals of the school nutrition program. So it is important to recognize the entire school nutrition team plays a critical role in providing quality customer service. It is the responsibility of the entire team to shape an environment that allows customers to fulfill their potential emotional, social, and physical being. What each of you do has a major impact on the school nutrition program, so you are important. As you see, there are so many things you can do to help your school nutrition program be a success, including making important decisions, ensuring students eat nutritious meals in a pleasant environment, nurturing your customers, and connecting with both teachers and parents. All of these things are important tasks and responsibilities. If you did not realize it before, I hope seeing the stars show how important you are to your customers, your coworkers, and to the success of your school nutrition program. You may find more information about achieving quality customer service among school nutrition staff in the online portal on the Institute of Child Nutrition website. And now I will turn the presentation over to Laura. Thank you, Janae. I want to uh, share with the group this afternoon uh, how we started in terms of the looking at customers uh, from our staff point of view. So, so back in 2015, we were experiencing about a 15% absentee rate. Our entry level wage was barely $10 an hour and our competition was $12 to $15 an hour starting level. We had complaints from working staff when we were sh short at schools. It affected the quality of the menu. We weren't able to serve the whole menu sometimes when uh, four or five of the staff were out. Uh, what we found is customer loyalty went down when the menu was not served as printed and we got lots of complaints. And then there were cost and revenue implications. So 
we did a survey and when we looked at and we disaggregated it among all the different levels of our school food service staff when we said i'm actively looking for a job outside we saw immediately with our school food service assistant that 57 percent or almost 60 percent were looking for a job outside of ocps that's a very valuable position because it took a lot for them to grow into that uh, as food service assistant three so it's two classes every year uh, to be able to upgrade into a level three. And that level three is over uh, 1150 an hour. So we really were uh, very concerned when we saw this kind of data. I wanted to show you the fishbone structure. This is something that you can Google and you can look at uh, the uh, image of the fishbone. What it does is it forces you to go through different things that could be affecting that 57%. So it forces you to look at people, and we looked at employee engagement. We looked at whether there was support to colleagues, lack of confidence in their potential. We looked at the environment, their workload. We also looked at their materials, and you'll find out that uniforms became very important the training, and then also the recognition. So again, that's the fishbone and just Google that. I also want you to have the uh, materials that we used and it's the uh, GFFOA. Uh, and basically it's a managing performance guideline. And that's what we started with when we look, started looking at engagement of our staff. So the SFA3, which was formerly in the old days, our cook position, um, we really wanted to look at what we expected of them. And so the first thing was computer skills. Of course, this is all of the uh, uh, project uh, and the uh, menu and all of that kind of documentation. We reviewed what they currently had, and then we started communicating to the managers that their SFA3 was the one that could help them with their records at the end of the day. Uh, we also offered a lot more food safety classes. So in this training for the SFA3, this was uh, absolutely the most important thing that we could do was to start working on the serving it safe and actually uh, going to the National Restaurant Association Serve Safe certification. And there you've got uh, one of our SFA3s helping her manager finish her production records at the end of the day. And then we had additional training and we held this at our Orange Technical School and had the chef uh, develop a test app for us so that we knew that their culinary skills would match a certain level. So basically we thought that we were going to be recruiting uh, SFA3s to come in from the outside and be competitive with the job market. We wanted to develop a career ladder because that's one of the things that gives people hope when they come in at $10 an hour that they can build up to a higher level. And we found out that we actually started focusing on the SFA too because they were the ones that uh, were fully engaged working with us and wanted to become an SFA3 and uh, actually that improved our customer survey service. So in 2016, we did another survey to gauge the impact of all of that training. And actually one of the trainees, we had the managers and the SFA3s come in together. So in 2016, we asked the SFA3s, do you feel food service is recognizing and empowering you to advance? and we came up well above 75% do think that. Have you been able to apply what you've learned at your uh, current location? You'll see it's not perfect. There are still a lot of managers that don't want anyone to touch their production records, um, but it's almost to 90%. And then an additional survey was sent out in April 2017 and uh, we actually gained a little bit higher uh, job satisfaction in terms of the extremely and moderately satisfied over uh, 90%. So it's important to continue to uh, looking at the, the attitudes and the beliefs for the food service staff. 
So here in Orange County, I don't get to see the employees all the time uh, because we have 226 schools, but we have supervisors assigned to groups of schools and they will see them, but not always do we know what grade level each one of the staff members is. So now we're starting to recognize each one level, the one, two, and three. Um, and in terms of upgrading, we've really emphasized uh, coming up from a level one to a level two. And in FY18, we had 67 employees, and that's out of 1,600. In FY19, we had 137, and FY20, 153. The upgrades for level three, our cook position, 28 in FY18, FY19 was 15, but in FY20, it was 43. So the level of culinary skills is growing within our staff. So um, we're doubling the number of, of classes that we've had each year, and we're probably just going to continue to increase because if people want to do an upgrade, we want them to. Uh, along with this, we're focusing in on the nutrition and the serve safe, and then we're also moving to scratch cooking. So one of the reasons that we wanted to have the culinary skills is that we're starting to cut and process our own produce. So instead of having uh, cabbage cut beforehand or broccoli cut beforehand or cucumbers, we bring them in and we can cut them on Friday and they'll still be fresh on Monday. So it's, the, it's really the first time that we've ever been able to serve fresh produce on a Monday. Uh, we have a memorandum of understanding with our Orange Technical College, which has a culinary college. Uh, we worked with a chef who developed a test out for external candidates or someone that hadn't taken our culinary one and two classes. And basically it equals the test out for a sous chef in a restaurant. So uh, we're continuing on with the culinary classes. So here's just a few pictures of people and what they're expected to do during the uh, test out. So they have so many portions that they prepare and then they're actually evaluated on the presentation of the portions and how they do uh, the recipes. So another thing that we decided to do was really develop our employee recognition. And basically this uh, became an ASAP award. Uh, in 2017-18, we had 241 employees nominated. This was a little difficult to get the managers to recognize one employee over others. And so we really had to convince them that it was okay if they just took one or two of their staff and recognized them, and then they could recognize others uh, in other years because they really wanted to be fair to their staff. Um, so you'll see that uh, basically we're increasing the number of employees that are nominated and we find out wonderful stories about these employees. Like for example, one woman in a high school is the only one that can get uh, one of our special ed students to eat and it's only because she sings to him while he's eating. So those are the great stories that we get to share. We also do an operations uh, survey and obviously in customer satisfaction, we'd like to score a full five points. But in FY18, we were at 3.4. FY19, we were at 3.5. We're hoping as a result of our uh, recognition and our upgrades that we'll even increase that this year. So one of the, the things that happened, and so this is five years later, in August, we hit the highest staff availability percentage that we've hit in the last five years. So, you know, that's one of our big success stories. We still have a ways to go because you don't want 8% of your staff uh, gone, but you can see there's vacancies and workman's comp and long-term leave and other things that uh, uh, work against us. We are tracking our new hires, and so we had 45 in FY18. In FY19, we had 65. This year, we had 51, but we're continuing on a weekly basis because now we have our own site, and people can come here directly and apply for, with us. 
So this is the last survey that we did. And so we had them select the level that they are. So you can see the results there. How satisfied are you with your job? We're uh, pretty excited about this in terms of the purple and the green. And uh, when you look at the actively looking for a job outside of FNS, we've uh, turned this completely around Whereas we had 57% uh, back in FY15 looking for an outside job, we only have 11% looking now. Uh, do you feel that FNS is recognizing and empowering you to advance? And so, again, we're pretty excited about the purple and the green being about, uh, well, higher than 85%. Do you feel that you're helping students get nutritious foods so they can succeed at learning? This is one of the things that I really focused on every year at our back to school meeting to make sure they knew that they are the reason that students can succeed. And I feel like that's one of those things that can really make them feel important uh, in the education process. So that is really getting across to them that they uh, definitely have a part of contributing to education. Do you feel you're valued for your contributions? We do have a ways to go there. And I think one of the things that we'd like to do is to start uh, suggestion boxes or having people write in comments that uh, will give them a feeling of that they've got a part of where we're going in our program. Do you think that work is distributed evenly across your team? Now, I have to tell you that was with fear and trepidation that we even asked that. But I think we came out pretty well. Um, you know, it's one of those things you don't want to ask the question unless you know it. And we certainly didn't know this, but it's good that we know it now. Do you feel like your job utilizes your skill and abilities as much as it could? Really uh, extremely satisfied with this um, based on the fact that 51% agree and 29%, uh, almost 30% strongly agree. So uh, I don't feel like we're moving too fast. I feel like we're moving at a rate that we can keep up with. And then the last one, do you think the meals served to students are nutritious and of high quality? Just absolutely elated with the fact that uh, 30, almost 40% and almost 30% agree that they are high quality and nutritious. So. That's just a, a great result to get. So as a result of this last five years in really engaging the school food service staff, basically we've got managers now who want an SFA3, whereas before they may have had staff that were a one or two or a three and they really didn't recognize them. And in fact, we emphasized cross training. We didn't really recognize the fact that each level had different skills. Now our staff are encouraged to take classes. We have them all over the county. And so we even have some of our nutrition classes on a Saturday. Our customer service results are valued based on what they're telling us. They like the idea that they have a part in education. Uh, performance management is a lot easier when people are satisfied with their job. So looking at the way the meals are served and the fact that we have SFA threes who are really responsible for measuring uh, the, re the recipe and uh, looking at the presentation, it's really been a great culture shift. Overcoming our risk and threats, we certainly don't want to lose staff. And in another uh, five years, we'll have a whole new theme park opening and you know, we just want to make sure that we mitigate the, the risk of losing anyone to the theme parks. Uh, the professional culinary experiences are really good for us. And so we'll continue uh, to train and invite chefs in and continue uh, developing the culinary skills. So it's really been such a, a great experience with getting new uniforms. We actually have one of our managers who's a uh, um, graduate of the Culinary Federation, and so he gets to wear his tall hat. We have our ASAP awards and uh, bring people in for their pictures along with our COO. And it's just been a great experience. We still have a ways to go, but um, 
we're going to continue working on it. So I have the polling questions up. So what is your average turnover rate? And you can mark yours and then I'll tell you what ours used to be and what it is now. And then do you send out surveys to your staff to find out their satisfaction rate with their job? And then do you have a recognition program for your employees? Okay, so it looks like uh, there's very few of you that have over 10%. Unfortunately, we were over 10%, but we brought it back down to about 7%. You send out surveys to find out the satisfaction rate, and it looks like about 23% uh, do. I would encourage all of you to. And then do you have a recognition program for employees? It looks like 40% do, 60% do not. I would definitely uh, recommend that you start some kind of a recognition, uh, some kind of a plaque or picture that is up to make sure people know that their staff in their kitchen are great employees. So at this point, I think we'll turn it over to questions. So the first question is, just make sure I'm understanding, you did not increase wages, but rather offered additional training. Every time they move up on the ladder, they get an increase in wage. It's really not much, but I think to move to a level two, it's about 30%, or I'm sorry, 3%, but moving up to a level three, it's a 9% uh, raise. And then uh, how do you pay for plaques or recognition awards? That's something that is an approved uh, item under USDA funding. So we can use program funds for that. Um, and we do. Uh, the starting wages by level one. So our level one right now makes about 1068. Our level two is about 10, almost 1090, and our level three is 1165. So it's, it's uh, starting to be competitive if you look at things like Walmart that uh, start at $12 an hour. And how do you provide hands-on training when your labor budget doesn't allow for it? We're very fortunate in Florida that our Department of Agriculture will provide the training at no charge. So we'll let them know that we want to have a serve safe or a serve safe, serving it safe uh, class and they won't charge for it. But uh, one of the things that I will tell you is I did develop a training team uh, probably about six years ago. And the training team does a great job welcoming people in to a one week introduction into school food service. So they meet in-house a couple of days and then they go out to the schools for three days and then when they're placed in their school a week later one of the training team goes out and checks on them and we started to look at the retention rate of all of our new employees and we've only lost two out of the last three or four hundred that we've hired so it's really turning into a great uh, onboarding process. 
and are we a union school district? All of our staff are in a union except for our managers, and they're not. And is the culinary training conducted in-house? Uh, we have both. We have the Orange Technical School that um, has the subjective training and the test out, and then our training team develops the culinary one and two classes. And I'd be glad to share the test out. It's basically just doing in a certain time frame the number of uh, items that they can cut and slice and prepare a recipe and uh, measure things accurately. Uh, how did we develop the fishbone diagram? I didn't develop it. It was just uh, something that was in our performance management recommendations. And then we just Googled it because it was a way to evaluate your results. And believe me, after that FY15 survey, we were uh, feeling pretty bad. So the fishbone diagram really uh, structured how we evaluated and how we were going to develop our goals to move forward. And that was our whole district uh, management team that did that. Okay, I think I'll turn it over to Spencer at this point. Thank you, Laura. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, a little more about customer service from our program's perspective as it relates to our external and in internal customers. My talk today is, is titled Common Sense Approach because I believe all of us have an idea of what customer service means to us and how it is executed in our, day in our daily activities. Of course, the term customer can take on various meanings depending on our audience. Hi, Spencer. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Could you share your screen for us, please? Thought it was. We got it. Thank you, sir. All right. Sorry about that. Um, of course, uh, like I said, the term customer can take on, a very, on various meanings. Uh, service is an action term for the sake of this talk that describes helping or doing work for someone. Let's continue. Well, who are our customers? As you can see by the graphics here, uh, uh, those smiling faces represent uh, our, our students. Um, I know I'm stating the obvious, and we all know that our primary customers are, of course, our students. But let's not exclude our parents, our faculty and staff at our schools, and our community stakeholders in their importance to our programs as well. We've probably all heard the cliche, a, hung, uh, a, hungry, child, a hungry child will eat. I do not believe that's altogether true. My belief is that a hungry child who believes they are provided with a quality meal and a good service experience will eat. If parents see our service, services as beneficial and satisfying to their children, they have greater confidence in us in the, in the services that we provide. Likewise, if community stakeholders recognize best practices in our services they usually support and recognize, recognize what we do. And that, that also gives us opportunity, uh, good opportunity for community networking. As we take a deeper dive into this conversation, I want to emphasize that reaching and appealing to our primary audience is possible, but it does have its challenges, of course, in comparison to how other members of the greater food service industry influence children as customers and consumers. Who are we competing with to attract customers and what advantages 
do our competitors have over us? As you can see the graphic, I think that we all can look at that graphic and, and determine uh, some of these businesses that, uh, that we know that either we participate in or that our children or students and customers participate in. We may see some of the products here along the bottom that we may actually serve in our schools. But these, these represent who we are up against on a daily basis in the type of cues and signs that our, that our children see on a daily basis. The American Marketing Association states that kids are influenced by the four P's. As you can look, look at the graphics, you have a product, you have product placement, you have price. We all know about these days when we, when we, we look on commercials or we, uh, uh, or we look at social media advertisement that we can see that the $5 meal or the $4.99 meal is very popular. So price is, price is very, uh, very key advertisement in drawing customers in. And of course, promotion. One advantage that our competition has is that they of course can uh, draw, draw, you, draw our customers in, our kids in with uh, um, movie promotions and toys and all of these sorts of things. As school nutrition leader, we're, we're definitely competing with all service operators and manufacturers that have ready access to our kids. Historically, this was, you know, this also this used to be accessed primarily by TV, but today it combines the mobile, the mobile phone and internet advertising as well. I'm not trying to, I don't want to try to make these companies out to seem as villains, rather than bringing awareness to, to, to the issue. Parents have a great deal of responsibility in monitoring what their, what their children are exposed to and, they help, and to help educate them on what are the best options. But it can be tricky in today's, in today's environment. As you, can, as you can see from the slide, advertisers are well banked on what they, on what they have to spend uh, compared, compared to our budgets that we have in our, in our programs. As, as stated here, $17 billion is spent annually, and, every, and, and, and kids are bombarded with about 20,000 targeted ads uh, every year. Also, marketing influences food preferences and habits. I have a story. I have a story I like to like to share with you. I it was it was a, a couple years ago. I had a student call me from one of our local high schools, and he wanted to talk about uh, his dissatisfaction with what we were doing and providing the services that we were providing at his high, high school, specifically the food. Uh, sometimes we have to have those conversations from time to time. I felt that this conversation was kind of interesting because I was I was sort of surprised because it was one of our most one of our highest participating high schools, and I knew for a fact that we we did a pretty good job at this at, at this school. We're not perfect, but I, but we definitely were doing a good job over there, and I had a great team over there. So this young man, uh, we 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 went. We went through our conversation, and he, and he kept saying how dissatisfied he and his peers were with the food. And I said, well, can you tell me exactly what do you have a problem with? And he said, all of it. He said, everything you serve there is just bad. Everything is, is not worth eating, is not worth feeding to us, and it's just, you know, it's, 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 a shameful, it's a shameful situation. And I was like, I'm just so, so surprised, and I, and I hate that you're having that experience over there. I said, but we do have a pretty – high participation at this school. And his reply was, well, that's because kids don't have anything else to eat. And I was like, well, okay. I said, well, well, I said, well tell me about your experience. I said, uh, do you eat in the cafeteria? And he said, no, never. I said, you've never eaten in the cafeteria? He said, no, sir, I do not. So I said, well, what do, how do you go about getting through the day or what do you eat to get you through the day? He said, well, you know, I go to places like Wendy's. And, and I asked him the question. I said, well, <clears throat> I said, uh, I said, you enjoy Wendy's? And he said, yes, I do enjoy Wendy's. I said, you enjoy the products that they provide? He said, yes, I do enjoy the products that they provide. I said, do they always get it right at Wendy's? He said, no, they don't. And my reply was, and I wasn't being sarcastic, but I did ask, I said, but you eat it anyway, right? And his, and his response was, yeah, I guess I do. 
I said, well, I said, I, I said, why is that? He said, but he, he really could, he really couldn't give me an answer at that time. But I was just trying to, I was just trying to make a point about how uh, we are conditioned to like certain things. But when it, when it comes to the service that we provide sometimes to our students, we, we have a tough mountain to, uh, to climb in relation to what our kids see outside of our facilities. Children today are very sophisticated in their, in their uh, taste and what they get exposed to. The child in 2019 is not the child in 1999 or definitely not the child in 1979. Our kids, our kids have uh, more information at their fingertips. Uh, they, can, they can go into their, their pockets or onto a computer and, and, and get an answer for, for a topic that years ago would have taken, taken probably a day of research. So you, we, we cannot discount that our children are watching, learning, and are exposed to a lot of things. Since we know as, uh, as operators the degree of influence have over our kids, we have to be creative and we have to be assertive in our methods to draw in and win over our student customers. Otherwise, you know, there definitely can be issues that could put our, our programs participations at risk and that could detrimentally financially affect our school nutrition programs, of course. Our most important tool in winning over our students is effective customer service and the key concepts that it encompasses. Oh yes, and I also like to add about, about the influence that kids have over their parents. Kids have the influence over parental, parental spending. For any of us that have children, we know that our, that our kids pretty much can kind of direct, direct a, lot of, a lot of the purchases that, that we make. And that is also, that is also felt in school. If, if kids don't want to participate in, in our program, they will not. Methods for, promote, for, for promoting custom, customer service. Some of these things that you're going to see are, are probably things that you're already doing, and some of these things may be somewhat of a, of, of a reminder and a refresher. Promoting and controlling your message is key to promoting your service to customers and the general public. This helps to take some assumptions about your program out of the minds of customers. At the district level, this can mean displaying your menus on multiple platforms, for example, online. Parents love a good online web page. This is especially popular, I'm sure, in your district because I definitely know it's, it's popular in ours. It permits them to make decisions for their child before they even enter, enter our doors, enter, enter the doors of the cafeteria. An effective web page can be a means of listing all services that you offer and program accomplishments, along with pertinent, pertinent contacts all in, one, all in one place. As you are aware, whether, whether, whether you run your own web page or contract to have them hosted, the technology exists today that enables us to deliver effective messages. I've had the opportunity to do this two ways. I remember when I was a much smaller district of about 40 schools, uh, and, and web pages were becoming the new thing. Uh, about, well, in my, in my experience, about maybe about 19 years ago, I, I had my first experience with a web page, maybe 15. And and at that time, we had no clue. We did not have the resources in-house in order to perform this. And somebody introduced me to a company to, that, that offered great value in doing this. Now, the good thing about it is that they, they offered us a, a series of things that were readily, readily posted. They customized it to the design of your, of your district graphics and, and colors. And then you had access to add things like your menus and notifications and web links and things like that. But they also, but they had already had information on there that would be general information about school, school nutrition and health and health and wellness. And it was not, and it was not an expensive price point. Later on, when I, when I had an opportunity to move to a larger district, which our, which our district is about 100, 140 sites, uh, I came to a district that had greater resources in its IT department and that was managing its own web pages. Um, 
we were a part of that, and our webpage was being managed by the by the district. And I had a couple, I had one or two people in my department with the expertise in order to uh, help us manage that manage that process as well. But as things change and as things evolve, we ended up moving back to a uh, a, a service in which we uh, we have somebody to uh, host part, a portion of those services. And so it's been it's I would say that since technology changes. Uh, quickly, we know it. We know it changes every day. You have to decide which is going to be the best, most effective methods for sending out your messages electronically. As far as as far as selling your program at the site level, you have to make sure you set standards and quality control. All team members have to work towards upholding these standards in their respective roles because all have a vital part. Selling your program involves providing service, providing a, of course a service environment that, that was clean, that is clean, orderly and appropriately set up for the grade level that it served. As Laura mentioned earlier in her presentation, uh, we also initiated the Serve Safe Manager program about six or seven years ago. Also at, at the same time, we, we required that all of our schools have a 95 or better health score as a requirement and a standard of our program to help promote to help promote greater confidence in the safety of our, of our of, of our department. In looking at in looking at the environment, if you use signage in your cap in your cafeterias or in your program, make sure they're visible and inform your customers and help direct them. Signage should be grade appropriate. It should be free of tatter, tatter free. It should be cleanable, uncluttered, and up to date. The the and when and when I say that, I would I would just like you to think of some situation maybe you've seen before. If if uh, if you've ever walked into a cafeteria and you've seen a food guide pyramid, then that food guide pyramid is probably about ten years old. Or if you've ever gone into a cafeteria and see a got milk a got milk poster and it's yellowed or it's folding up around the sides, it probably needs to be taken down. These are things that I've, that I've seen in, 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 my, in my experience in and outside of my, uh, my present work at, at this district. Next, I would say that the appearance of staff signifies professionalism. Um, we all probably have some sort of standard when it comes to employee dress in our cafeteria. Uh, they should be clean, you know, clean every day. They, it should be looking professional. Uh, at my, when I was at my smaller district, we never really had it. I wouldn't say we had a uniform program, but we definitely had a standard of clothing that we wanted our employees to wear. Unfortunately for us, only, if you could go from cafeteria to cafeteria and everybody would have a similar interpretation of what that meant. I always felt bad about it, but I never had the budget or, or I could never get district support that would support a uniform program. Today, that has changed. As you can see in the, see in the graphic, those are our snazzy, snazzy uniforms with the burgundy and the, and the somewhat of a chef hat and the, the, and the black pants. When I, first get, when I first came to the district, we were wearing hospital scrubs and you could not distinguish us from somebody that worked in the healthcare field or somebody who was working at a cafeteria. We, we decided later on to go to more of a, of a, shelf, a chef look. And I tell you, we are, we're very proud of it. And our employee, our employees, a lot of our employees take pride in the uniform. We do, we, do, we do still get some complaints, and so it's hard to satisfy everybody. But for the most part, I think that our employees uh, appreciate that we do provide them with a uniform to include shoes as well and that everybody is looking the same because I think it helps your customers uh, and your students at the school because they can easily recognize who the service, who the people are that are, that are providing them the service that they need. All of, us, all of this leads us to our most important selling point, which is the presentation of quality food which your, which your customers resonate the most with. The foods we serve should be exact to our menu and consistent with our recipes. I know sometimes it can be challenging to do, depending on, depending on whether you have a central kitchen, it could be a little bit more standardized, but in our case, we cook at 99% of our, our programs. Students recognize and appreciate food selections that are identifiable 
consistent, and tasty. In executing our menus, items need to be prepared at the proper temp, texture, color, and of the highest quality. This fact goes back to my previous slide about our competition. If you go to a number of those places that I mentioned earlier, one thing that you will see is consistency for the most part. One way to have students on, to have students have input in your menu is to use student taste tests, which we do here, and we do surveys. Before we offer any new items or recipes to our customers, we first provide them to a test group of students. We keep the test pretty simple, though, in that we use a yes or no vote or a happy or sad face response. If the majority is not for an item, we do not use it. I hardly go to food shows for this reason. I have vendors bring products, but I always tell them, if our students don't like it, then we're not going to serve it, no matter how much I necessarily like it. Additionally, we listen to the feedback on customer participation from our site and comments in determining our menu as well. Next, putting an emphasis on training and accountability. Emphasizing training and accountability is another method to promote good customer service. Well-trained staff take better care of customers and strengthen our organizations. As directors and supervisors, we have opportunities for constant professional development that we benefit from, as you know. Our site teams do not always have the time and opportunity for as much training as we would like to provide. Our site, my, current, my site staff currently only receive two official days of professional development a year. One of those days is devoted to uh, a, a day of class experience, and then usually another day is setting up their cafeterias for the beginning of the school year. We've had to be, we've had to be creative in trying to engage our site staff. One thing that we use, my equipment coordinator developed was 10 to 15 minute mini lessons that are provided by the site managers at, the, at, our, at our schools. And our chef developed a, we have a private YouTube page, which we have a catalog of short training videos that, that teach staff on recipe development and, and, a, and numerous other topics that we try to get in uh, during the year. Like most of you, we monitor our sites like all of our organizations do for quality control and to provide any needed assistance. We find concerns. We, when we find concerns, we address them immediately and retrain as needed. I believe effective training develops and empowers leaders at all levels. The result of quality, the result of quality training are employees that start to recognize problems and who become better at doing their job of caring for our customers, our students. We want our team members well-trained and happy doing their jobs. Building positive relations. We believe that building positive relations with our customers and among team members is important. We highly encourage in our new hires training, the, our new hires training, the importance of putting ourselves in place of the customers and keeping in mind how we want to be treated as customers. Our employees do this, do this, execute this different ways. One, one method I've seen, uh, one of my managers, I share this, is that she makes it a point to learn every child's name at her school. It, when I saw that, I was totally amazed that she could name every child name at her school after about a month of, of, of meeting these kids. <clears throat> Simply put, kindness is encouraged and professionalism in meeting the needs of our students and among our team members. It is evident at various sites in our, various sites in our district when this occurs because we see quality meals, efficient service, satisfied customers, and internal recognition. I think it is important that our team members be seen as vital members of that site and not fixtures. Additionally, our central office must lead by example and show praise and recognition for, for the services our team members provide. Employees feel cared about and supported, employees that feel, that feel cared about and supported take better care of customers. When a team member or members have a problem that is raised to me, I feel personally I need to help determine an effective solution as quickly as possible. I'd like to move to our polling question. And our polling question is, what method or methods 
best describe your current approach to promoting customer service? Okay. Well, it looks like the uh, the largest response was all the above. The the uh, and the smallest response was putting an emphasis on train putting emphasis on training at, at four percent. Policy and accountability adherence was at five. Leading by example was at nine. Building a positive relationship was at ten percent. But the the vast majority uh, elected for all the above. And There was no wrong answer to that, of course. I'd like to go to questions to see if anyone has any questions of me. All right, looks like, looks like we have one comment, and thank you for your positive uh, uh, comments, and I'm and, and glad that it's, this webinar is encouraging. And I have another question that says, uh, how do you pay for staff training? And this, per this person writes that they struggle to get the staff to want to do training outside of hours to work we pay for. Well, that is a challenge. That is a challenge for us. Now, we, we do set aside a, uh, a part of our budget uh, for training, <laughs> believe it or not. It's not always easy and it's not very large, but we do, but, but we do set aside. You have to invest in your program. So, you have to try to find some some line item or some something somewhere that you can add to your budget to provide training for your staff. As I said, as I said earlier, we try to be creative in providing training for the professional standards and that we use the many trainings, 10 to 15 minutes, and you can develop your a curriculum. You can provide the training sheet to your to your site supervisor. And they can go through this, go through this training, this training, this training um, topic with them for 10 to 15 minutes. Everybody signs off, and they get credit for doing that training. And we do that on a week, we do that on a weekly basis. Also, uh, I'm not, I'm not the, the the creator of this, but our chef learned learned how to produce YouTube videos, and it was trial and error. They they've definitely gotten better from the first to right now, to where. He goes in and does these 15 to maybe 5 to 15 minute to 20 minute videos on how to prepare a certain recipe, uh, mostly mostly on, on, on presentation and merchandising. And sometimes he produces them and uses our staff in those on those in those videos. And the staff really enjoys that, and they like to see them. They like to see themselves on video. And the manager has an opportunity to show those. Show those videos to to the staff, or staff can look at them on their uh, look at look at them on their own. Yeah. I'm not seeing any more questions, so I think that that is uh, that is there. There are all the questions. that we have. At this point, I'll be turning it over to Janae. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Spencer. So at this point in time, uh, we're gonna take a look at a few testimonies from some of our star managers. Mm -hmm. 
uh, some of the fun, exciting. Some of the fun, exciting. Sorry, everyone, I'm having a technical difficulty. Give me one second. Some of the fun, exciting things that I do for our students at our school for customer service is during the month of December, we do an elf on the shelf. And so every day the elf is somewhere. It's either hanging on the ceiling, it's, we have a big hot dog sign, and it'll still hang on the hot dog if it's hot dog day, or um, if it's spaghetti day, we'll make her a little table, put up on the, the heat bar, and she'll eat spaghetti and kind of lead the kids in that this is spaghetti day. We write on the bananas, uh, it's inspirational messages like smile, um, you're great, have a great day, be kind. Um, they really like that and they kind of dig through the bananas to see which motto or which phrase that they would like to, to pick. And then they go off and brag to their friends which one they got. I usually look at the recipes first, and then I go from there to decide which fast food I'm gonna make them think that they're eating today. And it usually gets them to come and at least taste the food, and then I go into the nutrient value of why they're eating the food and what part of the body that is gonna satisfy and make them feel better without actually feeling lazy after they eat dinner. On Dr. Seuss Day, we'll have our Read Across America Week, and so we celebrate that on Dr. Seuss's birthday and um, we will use green eggs and ham on the serving line and all the kids, they love to dress up. So I dress up with them, but I dress up like Cindy Lou Who's cousin. I'm Tammy Lou Who. I've got my dress on, I've got my hair up, and they're just really enjoying it and like, oh, I don't want that green egg, but try it. Just close your eyes and try it. Are you sure you don't want to try? Oh, come on, Sam, I am. Just try your green eggs and ham. They really do enjoy all that special attention that we do give them. I work at a juvenile detention center in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and working with juveniles, I like to show my appreciation by using some of the equipment that they built, like they have a welding program, and they built the uh, grill out of a barrel, and so I use on holidays, like 4th of July, Christmas, I grill out for them and show my appreciation to them. And I cook for them, I barbecue ribs, chicken, or whatever for them on those holidays to show my appreciation for them building that because it takes a lot of time and effort for them. Those kids are very special. Well, when they come in the door, I like to say, welcome to the Eagle's Nest. That's the name of our cafeteria. And we smile at them. We, we call each of them by name and ask them how their day is going. I hope that you all were inspired by those videos. Um, and now we'll move forward to conclude the webinar. So as you can see on the screen is um, ICN's new sharing site. So the Team Nutrition Healthy Meals Resource uh, System has moved to the Institute of Child Nutrition and is now part of our um, new sharing site, and, which is an online resource center providing child nutrition programs with the means for sharing valuable resources related to program operations. Um, this move will give child nutrition professionals a one-stop shop to access high-quality resources and training materials in the child nutrition community that support current federal regulations, policies, and guidance. The CNSS will be rolled out in phases. Um, here's the child nutrition recipe box provided um, 
It provides child nutrition program operators with recipes and prepare healthy and delicious meals that meet meal pattern requirements. And so ICN has launched this new introduction to HACCP for School Nutrition Programs, a course for frontline staff that discusses the basis of HACCP principles and explains why it is important for school nutrition staff to follow the school food safety plan and relates the knowledge back to the individual school environment. So just a final reminder that today's webinar has been recorded and can be viewed on the ICN website at www.theicn.org forward slash star. Please take a moment to complete the evaluation for this webinar. At the end of this webinar, you will see a pop-up asking if you would like to be taken to our survey. Please click yes and take a moment to complete the survey. Thanks again to our speakers, Spencer Taylor and Laura Gilbert. This concludes today's webinar. Have a great day.